How are you doing? Good. I want to I want to ask yeah. you how your family is. Oh, my family's doing really well. Thanks, yeah. Kyle. How um, about you? Yeah. Yeah, things are good. I mean, um we kind of have an extended family here. Um it's, you know, myself and Kazuko and then oh. <laughs> And then I we have uh Coco. Yeah. Yeah. She's gorgeous. Yeah. So um, for people who are joining, we're just having a quick chat. We'll start right at nine, uh, 10 o'clock. Thanks for joining us. Uh, yeah. Coco was a kitten that I rescued at my house and Kyle adopted. Now she's part of your family, right? Yeah. 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 <laughs> she, of, of all the cats that we've um, rescued, I guess. She was the most wild. Right. At first, she was so wild. She was really wild. Uh, yeah. I wasn't sure I could trap her. Uh, I trapped, neutered, and released her mom, who was too wild. Um, but the mom's still around every day. We still feed her, and she hangs around with the the twins, who are Coco's brothers. Oh yeah. wow! Oh, <laughs> wow! Do they ever meet? The mom and the twins outside. Yeah. Every day. Oh, every wow. day. Yeah. Wow. Yeah. All right. It's 10 o'clock. Let's start. Welcome, yeah. everyone. This is Seek Sustainable Japan. I'm JJ Walsh in Hiroshima. And today, I'm so excited to talk once again to Kyle Holsuter hey. in Okayama. We are neighbors. I cannot believe I haven't been out to see Kamimomi Perm Permaculture Center. That is on my list this year. I'm definitely going to get out there. Yeah, I'm looking forward to it. Awesome. So Kyle, uh, it's great that you could connect. We actually saw each other at the Minka Summit last year. Yep. Um, that was really fun to see you there and mm -hmm. to hear you talk about what you're doing with the Permaculture Center. You have so many wonderful events coming up. Uh, for people that don't really know, I think most people joining, they already know you. But for people who don't really know, can you just give us an uh, overview of what Permaculture Kamimomi does? Yeah, yeah, sure. Um, first, kind of like a, a brief background on permaculture. Sure, sure. Uh, the mm -hmm. word permaculture is a contraction of two words, permanent and agriculture. Uh, the, the two people who came up with the word, David Holmgren and Bill Mollison, they, um, were, they're Australian. Um, and they developed the concept in the 1970s. Um, oh, Coco, it's going <laughs> to... And uh, it's it's uh, not just organic farming. Um, it's a design system considering, you know, all human needs, the, the hard needs like energy, food, shelter, uh, and then also soft needs like community, um, economics. Um, and it, it began um, agriculturally based, but now the, the concepts of permaculture have been, have been applied in a variety of different fields. Um, and kind of our mission was to use the, the permaculture design system to revive the Japanese Satoyama countryside. And the, the interesting thing is, the more, I, the more I get to know the Japanese Satoyama, I see that it was originally designed according to permaculture principles. You know, it's, it's native Japanese permaculture. I, I saw your NHK. It was great to see you on NHK oh, at Japanophiles. And it was so wonderful to see permaculture being introduced uh, on that show. And one of the things the narrator or the interviewer was saying is, oh, it's like going back to the old ways. And you said, actually, it's going back to the old ways, but using modern technology like solar as well, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. And also, I mean, um, our needs are different from people who lived 200 years ago. Um, so, yeah, we're going to have to develop new systems and uh, new structures to, to meet those needs. Yeah, great. Uh, it was wonderful to see uh, on NHK. How did, how did you have any good response after the show? With? It just went oh. this month, right? Yeah, yeah. Um, I guess I, I haven't had that many you know, people contacting me saying they, they saw it, but um yeah yeah i think it i think it turned out really well and the 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 director i think did a really good job of kind of explaining my story how i came to japan and got into japanese plastering and now our work um in permaculture in okayama 
And uh, I'll put the link here because uh, anybody can watch it now. It's available on NHK On Demand. Awesome. And, thank you. And I believe that they'll they'll have it on demand for a year and then take it off. Uh, yeah. Which is, it's kind of sad when they take it off and you can't access the old ones. So make sure you watch it this year. <laughs> Appar apparently, like, um, I mean, it's it's kind of frowned upon, but you can put it up on YouTube. Oh, OK. And they don't they don't apparently from what I've heard, they don't make you take it down. All right. And uh, you so in the in the show, you had a chance to talk about uh, your getting your degree in plastering. Uh, you showed uh, Peter how to plaster a little bit. I love that part when you're like, don't worry, I'm a good teacher. <laughs> <laughs> and this is something that we'll talk about for your upcoming events as well, because you do a lot of teaching of plastering and natural plaster techniques around Japan, right? Yeah. Um... Plastering, natural building. Um, yeah, we, we offer a number of courses at Permaculture Center Kamimomi. Yeah, well, let's talk about some of them. Now, you just, uh, you are going to be one of the speakers at the permaculture course in Chiba. Uh, can yeah. you tell us about that permaculture oh, design course? Yeah, this is an amazing opportunity. Um, and I'm, I'm working with two incredible teachers, two other incredible teachers, um, Phil Cashman and Kai Sawyer. Um, Kai Sawyer is, oh, that's, that's Phil Cashman. Um, F Phil, uh, is, uh, half Japanese, half Irish, and that's, uh, Kai Sawyer. Um, I guess, uh, yeah, Phil was born in Niigata Prefecture, grew up in Tokyo, um, studied in the United States, and then studied Australia in permaculture. And I think of, um, I do quite a bit of travel for teaching natural building plastering um permaculture so i've seen a lot of i've seen a lot of permaculture sites abroad um and in japan and um i feel like every time i go someplace i'm like yeah phil's design is he's he's a good designer yeah so i re i really admire him and kai is i think probably the the face of permaculture right now in japan um, he probably has the largest network, works with the most people, um, based in Isumishi in, in Chiba Prefecture and in Tokyo, um, and has done the most in kind of getting permaculture out to the, the public. Um, so yeah, it's an incredible opportunity to, to work with those two or to, to learn from those two. Um, it's taking place at a, a cultural, uh, cultural heritage site, um, thatched roofs, um, you know, just like classic Japanese architecture, kominka, um, and uh, yeah, it's uh, it's going to be a. I think it's going to be an incredible opportunity. And another really special thing about this permaculture design course is that we take um, daily outings to a number of different permaculture sites in the area. Um, we're going to go to to Phil's place in Southern Chiba Prefecture, um, Permaculture Awa. Um, permaculture Awa is a is a really uh, interesting site. It's about 300 square meters, um, so it's very compact, and which makes that's that's a photo of Permaculture Awa, um, Kai teaching at Permaculture Awa. Very compact. It's very easy to see the systems and the connections between the different elements because it's like a it's kind of like suburban scale. Um, and we'll also go to uh, Kai's um, Permaculture in Peace Dojo. Yep, that's a photo of it there. Um, and uh, he's done really cool things with like um, very simple um, two by four building. You know, it's very like appropriate technology. Um, anybody can do it um, and planted lots of fruit trees. So that's a, another great place to visit. We're going to visit uh, a site called Uzume. Yeah, that's it there. That's Uzume. Um, kind of a huge permaculture site in Chiba Prefecture large forest garden lots of natural building um and one of the one of the buildings there is a building that phil and i and another person three people we built um over the course of a year uh, a really comfortable cottage making use of all local timber um rice husk insulation all earth plasters lime plasters so yeah lots of lots of interesting visits during yeah. that course as well. Oh, that's so exciting. That sounds great. Anybody who's in Chiba or Tokyo, you're really near or even further away. It's a seven day course, two parts. 
It's a, it's a two, it's a two week course. Two weeks. Okay. Two week course in two separate weeks. And I should also mention that it's taught in Japanese. Okay. Yeah. But you have international people there who might be able to help. <laughs> uh, it's a bit difficult, I, right? Yeah, yeah, yeah. I think. But but we have talked about offering a course in English, a permaculture design course in English, um, in Japan. I think there's enough of a um, a need for people looking to do a permaculture design course in English in Japan. I think so, definitely, especially with all the international uh, residents that we saw at the Minka Summit. Mm -hmm. I think the, a lot of them would be interested in something like this, don't you? Mm -hmm, mm -hmm, mm -hmm. Yeah, yep. it, it looks like such a great concept. And then at the end, you get a certificate for permaculture design, right? Yeah, um, the, the permaculture, the, the history is is very grassroots. Um, Bill Mollison taught the first permaculture design course in 1979. Um, and basically the, the, the structure is once you've taken a course, um, you can teach the course, right? I mean, of course you, it takes years to get the experience and the knowledge to be able to teach a really good course. And I think, um, kind of this, the system of people wanting to, to learn from good teachers is kind of self-governing right you don't have to worry too much about it um but it's really a grassroots thing you know there's no there's no hierarchy there's no structure controlling controlling it so yeah it's a i think it's a really neat movement that's so cool uh i just want to give a quick shout out to some people that are joining us live great to see you natasha on youtube and great to see you wendy on face uh, youtube as well today yeah awesome so Wendy was one of the organizers of Minka Summit. Um, right, that Wendy. Right? Yeah. Yeah. She, she she back in Japan or she in the U.S.? Oh, she says she's in Illinois right in now. In Illinois. Yeah. Okay. It's great to have you, Wendy. Wonderful, you could join. Um, another uh, really cool thing about that that course, which I think you talked about in the NHK show as well, is talking about the design of things, like how you. Uh, create your buildings under a forest. Uh, and then part of the forest, you don't touch and you just let nature do its work. Um, can yeah. you just talk a little bit? I have this great graphic. Yeah, uh, yeah. Here. that's a, that's a yeah, beautiful design. Um, there's, there's a number of different principles and design tools in permaculture. Probably one of the design tools that's most uh, widely known is zoning. Um, placing elements according to their frequency of use. So the things that you use most often you want closest to you and the things you use less often you want farther away. And that's just um, efficiency of movement and time. Um, another design tool is um, using elevation to move energy and materials through a site. And I think um, looking at the the typical Japanese farm or the Japanese countryside, Satoyama, from this perspective, is really interesting because we see how the traditional Japanese farm was designed according to this principle. Um, below the house, you have the kitchen garden, and below the kitchen garden on the, the flattest land, you would have the, the rice fields. And basically, all of the, the wastewater coming from the house can be used for watering the garden and then is purified in the rice fields before it goes on to the next. Um, family or river. That's so and, connected to indigenous knowledge too, right? Yeah. Like yeah. whenever I visit Hawaii and they talk about uh, not building anything in the mountain, that's where the clean water comes through. Mm. And then it goes through the fields, they do organic farming, and then it goes to the fish farms, the fish pools before the ocean. You know, having that idea of using nature and using gravity it's it's in Satoyama, it's in old Japan, but it's also in indigenous cultures around the world, right? Yep, yep, exactly. Um, and on the theme of water, um, you see like the, the typical Japanese mountain village at the top of the mountain um, is where they have kind of virgin forest. Uh, and oftentimes you'll, you'll find a shrine or a temple there. That's, you know, where you don't, you don't cut the trees, that's just native habitat. And not only does that provide habitat for you know biodiversity it also is a water bank for that mountain those those big um broadleaf trees hold tons of water in their root systems and in the in the soil around the roots and then that water is slowly re slowly released and that's 
That's what we use at Permaculture Center Kamiomi. All of our water is provided through natural springs from the mountain. Um, and uh, and then like looking at the, the, the gravity and um, moving materials through the site. So all of the, the kitchen waste and the human manure from the home is composted and then used in the in the fields or the um, the rice fields, and then behind the house you have a plantation forest where you're bringing big timbers down um, to the house rather than lifting heavy things up, and then further away you would have uh, your like mixed deciduous forest that you would cut for fuel firewood. So really placing elements according to the frequency of use, and then also how the materials are moved through the site. Yeah, awesome. It's, it's great to have these these discussions, I think, over and over to give these examples because it sounds really complex, but once you start talking about it, once you start seeing it in action, I, I think slowly people start to understand the, the need for it in our mm. modern lives, right? You mm. must see that so much with the work that you do. Yeah, well, we, we live probably quite close to a, a traditional Japanese life. I mean, like, we don't, there's no... Um, natural gas or propane gas in our buildings. So all of our, our cooking and hot water is solar and, and firewood. Um, so yeah, the, the design of a traditional Japanese village makes a lot of sense for our, for our lifestyle. Wow, great. All right, uh, can you tell us about Open Day? Because you yeah. just had Open Day at the beginning of the month and your next one is May 28th. So yeah. what happens on Open Day? Uh, open day is a really fun day. Um, in the morning, I give a tour of the site. Then we have a potluck lunch. Um, and in the afternoon, um, we do an activity together, a fun activity. Yeah, those are some images from, from our open days, from our monthly activities. So generally, we, I take a, we do a tour of the site and we kind of look at the, the rice fields and um, our vegetable gardens and kind of all of our agricultural systems. Um, and we also look at all of our, our buildings as well, all of the kind of natural building materials we use and the different systems we're, we're developing and in the infrastructure. Um, and then the lunches are incredible. The potluck lunches are incredible. In fact, um, not just the potluck lunches, but like every day I'm amazed at the abundance. I'm like, who, who eats like this? Really, it, it's. Uh, <laughs> I want to eat like that. I want to yeah. eat like that every day, and, oh, and because you're eating so much locally grown, organic vegetables and fruit, I think you can and you should. We all should eat like that, right? Yeah, yeah, it's incredible, and and also lots of GBA. Are you familiar with that term? It's no. uh, like wild meats. Okay. Yep. Um, um, we we do do some trapping. Um, we haven't been successful ourselves. Um, but we get lots of um, wild pig and deer from local farmers. Which is a, a big problem all around Japan is is an overpopulation of wild boar at yep. the moment, right? Yeah, mil millions of dollars of agricultural damage to, to crops. Um, so yeah, um, it's important to kind of maintain the the Japanese Satoyama, the village, so it's not run over by, by wild animals. And it, it also provides a, a really important protein and, you know, some very delicious meals for, for us. Do you also have plant-based protein if you had uh, people who didn't want to eat meat? Yeah, we um, were, uh, I guess, um, last year we were self-sufficient in daizu, in soybeans. Nice. Um, we make all our own miso um, and we're making uh, soy sauce as well. Wow. Yeah. That's very cool. Uh, Natasha, and we grow lots of other beans as well, too. Yeah. Uh, grow, we need more beans uh, growing in Japan. We import yeah. so much soybean and, and so much other beans. We, we rarely grow them in Japan, but we use them all mm -hmm. the time, right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. yeah. Um, Natasha says, uh, are the potlucks vegetarian? So then we just answered that. As she said, also for indigenous knowledge in Egypt. It sounds very similar. Mm. And uh, Mika has says she likes learning about Satoyama. Nice. Great to nice. have everybody here while we're live. Cool. All cool. right. Uh, so the next event. Oh, and then in the, yes, in the afternoon. Ahead. Sorry. Mm -hmm. 
on, on open day. And then in the afternoon, we do an activity together. And the last activity we did was um, fruit tree planting. Oh, nice. Um, we're developing, I think, a pretty extensive uh, food forest. And um, I'll talk a little bit about the, the concept of the food forest. This was actually probably the, the original seed of permaculture. Um, as I understand it, Bill and David met at a lecture where um, Bill, in one of his questions or comments, pointed out that all terrestrial ecosystems, if they have sufficient precipitation and temperature, they head towards a forest. They naturally, they naturally evolve into a stable forest. But our agriculture, our common agriculture, tills, plants, harvests, tills, plants, harvests, every year it goes back to zero and, and starts over. And Bill, Bill thought, what, what would our agricultural look like if we modeled a forest? And uh, they, they came up with the, the food forest concept where you, you model um, a, an artificial ecosystem, a human, a human designed ecosystem after forest. So there's large trees, large fruit and nut trees, there's smaller fruit and nut trees, bushes under that. And then under that there's perennial vegetables, ground covers. Basically you're trying to fill every niche with a plant that is, provides you know, human food or fiber or dye or medicinal or creating a, 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 a you know a food forest so and the, it, in in that food forest do you include sansai the the wild vegetables like uh like warabi and mushrooms shiitake those you, kinds you of definitely things. can you definitely can right now our food forest has too much sun for a lot of them but a, a lot of wild vegetables do come up anyways in our in our food forest naturally nice I, I had a great interview uh, with the uh, author Winifred Bird, and she traveled all around Japan talking to people who know that food foraging culture. Mm. She wrote the book Eating Wild Japan. I always think back to a oh, lot cool. of things that she talked about. Yeah, very cool. Yeah, we're eating a lot of wild um, vegetables now this time of year. Yeah. yeah. Sometimes if I eat too much of the sansai, um, my tongue goes numb. And they say I might be allergic to something. So just be careful if your mouth goes numb, maybe ease off of it a little bit. <laughs> okay. I haven't had that. Problem but I do yet. love it. I, I think there's certain nettles or something that are, are a bit, you'd only get them if you're in the deep rural area. Mm -hmm, yeah. mm -hmm. But I love that idea of a food forest. I think that has so much potential all around the world. Right, Kyle? Oh yeah. Um, in fact, now we're, we're just, uh, two two interesting um, anecdotes. One is uh, I heard from my native Wisconsin in the United States. I've heard that um, some deer hunters, because their 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 goal is to is to get the biggest buck, right, the biggest antlers. But they're creating food forests to attract deer to their property. Isn't that cool? I mean, it has all these ecological benefits, right? Every you know for the biodiversity and. Um, life, just animals and plants and, and human food as well. That's kind so of, interesting. And yeah. connected also to a no-till farmer here in the Hiroshima area, uh, Thomas Klepfer. And yeah. he, he said he's starting to plant trees amongst his vegetable gardens because he realizes in the summer it's too hot. Yep. that he needs that shade at least partially during the day. So I think kind of bringing the forest into the, the agricultural crops as well as yep. we have global warming, right? Yep, yep. And, and the tree crops also can provide a more stable supply. They're not as susceptible to annual crops, to droughts and heat and frost. Absolutely. Um, I, I was always a fan of, of shade-grown coffee. Mm. Uh, which is a the thing. There's a great company in America called Thanksgiving Coffee Company, and they support a lot of shade grown coffee so that you don't have to chop down trees to make coffee plantations. Um, yes. So yeah, there's so many exciting innovation around the world. I love supporting those kind of organizations. Yep. And I, I think um, the, the coffee is also times grown with other like um, commercial crops as well. Um, sorry, I'm not from the tropics. I don't know exactly, but I think I think I remember hearing like grown with bananas or with other crops as well. Yeah, so that that kind of crop diversity that's also very in line with what you're trying to do at Permaculture Center. I'm sure, as a lot of organic farmers often talk about that, right? 
Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Yeah. Yeah. Um, so after uh, Open Day, uh, then the next event happening this month, next week, is Carpentry with Carter Brown. Is that right? Yeah, that's right. Um, Carter Brown is, I've, I haven't never met him in person. He's a friend of a friend. Um, he's a professional carpenter and he has his own construction company in the United States. And he was highly recommended by a very close friend of mine, um, a very close friend of mine, James Henderson, who is a natural builder in Washington in the American Northwest, said that Carter Brown is one of the best teachers he knows. So he's going to come and teach a three-day introduction to carpentry course where we'll put up a, a very simple um, shed um, as a as a lean on to an existing building so posts four posts two beams and uh, a shed style roof that's so interesting is this one of um his works yes that, those are those are uh carter's yeah, wonderful. And then uh, will you be doing plastering as well or just concentrating on the carpentry? Those three days will just be carpentry. And, and hopefully we can get, uh, you know, the roof, the roof on as well. Wow, great. And what a great skill. Uh, do you, you do collaborations with John Stolenmeyer as well. You're both in Okayama, right? Oh, man, I would love to work with John more. Yeah, he's, uh, um, I think, probably one of the most accomplished um, foreign carpenters in Japan doing like very traditional work. Yeah, I had the chance to go and see his uh, unveil of his uh, model home and his own home uh, kind of in combo. And that was just so much beautiful work uh, there. It was so great to see that. Have you been there yet? Oh, yeah, I did some. Yeah. I did a little plastering work in, at John's house. Nice, nice. It's so beautiful. Yeah, you guys are great collaborators. Uh, building up a lot of sustainable initiatives in Okayama. <laughs> yeah, and, and only like 30 minutes apart too. It's yeah, kind of interesting. Yeah, it's amazing. And then uh, in the beginning of May, you have a project to restore Akuda, yeah. a storage house. Can you yep. tell us about that? Yeah, this is a continuation of a, of a workshop that we hosted exactly a year ago in May during Golden Week. Um, and during that workshop, we we lifted this kura off the ground and re replaced the base plate around the base of the curl that had uh, that had rotten out. Um, yeah, you can see some photos there. Took out the base plate and then repaired all of the bamboo lattice that was damaged. Um, and we're going to continue work on finishing the exterior of the kura. the 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 lower three the lower three meters of the wall will be uh, yakisugi. The, the burnt cedar siding. And then above that will be a lime finish with a namako pattern. Are you familiar with namako kabe? Okay, it's a, it's common for kura in Japan. You see it quite often in kurashiki or in Hiroshima, Saijo has lots of kura. And there's a pattern of kind of the black squares. Yeah, you can see it in that photo there, the black squares with the white lines, the white grout. That's called a namako kabe in Japanese. Um, so I love that. It's always uh, associated with the the merchant houses. Yeah. In in a lot of areas, right? Yep. Yep. Merchant houses and also um, the earthen storehouses that you would store merchandise in or food stocks. Basically, the purpose of the kura is to protect things from fire. Really, really thick. You know, foot foot thick, thirty centimeters thick earthen walls that um, protect. The most valuable possessions from from fire. So in in rural Japan, that was your rice, your your food stocks, right? Your house could burn down, but you'd if you lost your rice, you know, you're you're in trouble. So, and then keeping your most valuable possessions in for for merchants, right? That's where you would keep like your your merchandise. I've seen some interesting innovation with remodeling old kura because they have such thick walls. Yep. I've seen some people turn them into bathhouses, like oh, have, cool. a, have a onsen inside. I think Shelly, uh, she's doing that with one of her, her houses as a kuda into a bathhouse. How cool. Yeah. Yeah. And um, so uh, John the, was talking about that too, I believe. <laughs> yeah. the, the, the person, the instructor teaching the course is named Hitomi Sensei. He's from Hyogo Prefecture. He was trained in Kyoto. He's now the 
the headmaster of a trade school. That's Hitomi Sensei there in the front. He's now the headmaster of a trade school in um, Hyogo Prefecture that teaches plastering. That's awesome. Yeah. Yeah. Oh, we had a, a question. Uh, is there significance of the pattern in the Namako Kabe? Is it just the traditional design or is there a significance there? there, there there's a number of different patterns. The most common one is like a checkered pattern um, where the, the tiles are hung like a diamond, right? And there's a, a checkered pattern is the most common one. There's also um, Shippo Moyo, which is uh, Shippo is, um, has a, a Buddhist significance of the, the seven treasures um, lasting for infinity or eternity. And that's an, another pattern that's oftentimes used in the, the Namako Kabe. Wow, that's really cool. Uh, Norie, thanks for joining on YouTube. He has another question. Uh, if any of the elderly folks in your neighborhood, have they given you any insights about Satoyama, if they remember? Oh, yeah. I mean, um, there, are some there are some super hyakusho around here. No, like, I mean... Real, real hyakusho. You, are you familiar with the term hyakusho? Hyakusho is a farmer in Japanese, but um, it's like a, um, subsistence farmer, right? Not like. Um, and there's there's people who were who were born on this mountain, have lived on this mountain their whole life, are really in touch with the mountain. I mean, yeah, I could tell you stories, but I don't want to like freak your your audience out. But like real real people who know how to live off the land here. That's amazing. And yeah. I remember in your NHK show, uh, you were telling him how you found that place, uh, that you you just went and visited and you took a picture and you asked about it and people said, oh, do you want to go see it? Right? Yeah. Um, I was, I first went to the, came to this area for work. Um, there was an organization locally that was interested in straw bale building. And I'm the the president of the Japan Straw Bale Building Association. So I, I first came to the area and um, just taking a walk one morning, um, I saw the kura. And since I'm a plaster, I really like kura. So I, I went to take a closer look and I noticed that the house, there, there was nobody living at the house. It was you know abandoned. So I took a photo of the house and I showed it to the chief of the village. And he said, oh, that, that house is open. Would you like to meet the owner? Um, the owner had left that house when he was 18, uh, moved to a different prefecture, got married and, you know, has his life there. So he was, he was quite happy to um, find somebody who could make use of it. That's great. And that's, that's one of the issues that I think a lot of people don't really know about with the uh, Akia or abandoned homes is a lot of them are owned by someone who doesn't want to sell because they're kind of holding on to it for their family who might yeah. want it in the future. And so we have a lot of these areas where half the houses are empty and it's, it's very difficult to get people who are committed to living there. Um, yeah. They don't want to have just a beso like ghost town where it's only a weekend houses or something. They want people committed to living and working there, right? Yeah, gro growing rice requires a community. Um, that's one of the that's I think one of the characteristics of of agriculture in Japan. It takes the whole community to, to maintain the the water lines for the water for the rice fields. Um, so yeah, they're. They want more young people. But as you pointed out, there's also this very strong sense of place in Japan. Um, the ancestral house is the ancestral house, right? Um, and thinking about selling that house to somebody you don't know is actually quite a quite foreign concept for a lot of Japanese people. Very understandably so, right? Your yeah. your land is is your heritage that you're going to pass on to future generations, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, great comment as well. Thank you for the question. And he said he wants to come and visit now. He loves nice. loves the idea. Yeah. Um, and then speaking of rice planting and preserving the the water lines, you have a rice planting workshop in the middle of May, right? Yeah. Um, we host a year long rice cultivation course. It starts in October every year and then ends in October. Uh, and, uh, you know, we um, prepare the rice fields, um, flood the rice fields, start the seedlings, sow the seeds, make seedlings. And in May, I think it's May 13th and 14th. Is that right? 
Yeah. Just want to get my dates. Yeah. My it dates. looks like May, May 13th is yeah. what I found. Yeah. Yeah. May 13th and 14th. Um, we're, we're hosting an, what we call an open campus and we host an open campus twice a year, one for rice planting and one for harvest in the fall and September. Um, anybody can, can participate. There's no participation fee. Um, and it's a great opportunity to, to meet the participants in our, in our year long course, and also to learn more about um, our cultivation methods. Uh, and it's always a great time. Um, we've got a lot of, we've got a lot of participants this year in our course, so it's going to be a lot of fun. Wow, great. Yeah, I, I think um, rice planting and especially you're doing it organically, right? You're doing yeah. it without pesticides. Oh, yeah, of course. Of course. Yeah. No, uh, yeah, no, no pesticides, no herbicides, um, no chemical fertilizers. Yeah, yeah. I, I saw that um, in the NHK video, they introduced uh, some of the people who joined your course yeah. and they were talking about, oh, isn't it wonderful? You can do it without chemicals and you can really take care of the environment and you can grow food. And it's just, oh man, that must just fill your heart with joy to hear someone from the course say that, right? Yeah. Yeah. And I, actually, um, our instructor is um, from Chiba Prefecture. Um, every month we connect to him via Zoom um, for, a, for a monthly lecture. Yeah, that's a, that's a video of our, our course a couple of years ago. Um, and uh, he, he, he kind of takes it a, a step further, like um, in terms of tilling and, and providing weed control and providing fertility, what we try to do is we try to have the, the, the organisms, the, the life, the animals in the, in the rice paddy ecosystem provide all those functions for us. And our job is just creating the field where those things can thrive. So it's, uh, it, he doesn't use the word permaculture, but that is a, a permaculture concept. Yeah, fantastic. Do you use any animals to help you maintain pest control, like ducks in the rice um, field? No, we don't, but I, I'm, I am really interested in that. Yeah. Yeah. I always wonder if, because I do see organic rice uh, being grown and they always have ducks. And I wonder if they put the ducks in or the ducks just came naturally uh, because it was organic. No, there's a, there's a type of, there's a cultivation method in Japan called Aigamo Noho, where they introduce ducklings um um early in the in the life of the the rice and those those small ducklings don't hurt the rice and as the rice gets bigger the ducks get bigger and uh, they eat insects their poop becomes fertilizer um the the paddling action of their feet helps kind of like till the soil to control weeds and they also eat weeds as well yeah it's a it's a great method i we, we oftentimes kind of talk talk about giving a, an experiment in the future yeah, it'd be great. I, I went to one organic uh, rice farm and they had ducks. And I remember we were pushing the weeds back under the mud, under the water, which is one of the techniques. Mm -hmm. And the ducks were following us around and it was so cute. <laughs> nice. yeah. It made it made it more fun. Work, work went much easier. <laughs> mm -hmm. Yeah, with those cute ducklings. Cute ducks to watch. And they're yeah. so fun. Yeah. And then uh, in mid middle of May as well, or toward the end, you have a kids permaculture uh, event, right? Yeah, May 19th, 20th, and 21st, a permaculturist from Portland, in the United States, is, gonna, is coming to Japan. His name is Matt B. Bull. Um, and Matt is a really interesting educator. Um, I've seen him teach and work with kids a number of times. He's really good with um, helping the kids to develop observation skills, um, um, on, like observing nature, getting to know nature better, um, developing a connection with, uh, with the world around them. It's really, I've, I've really enjoyed watching him work and he's coming um, to our area um, May 19th, 20th, 21st, and the 19th, he's going to give a lecture on uh, developing play areas for, for kids. Um, and we're also going to have a potluck dinner, too, and kind of a, a, an opportunity for people to chat and um, mingle. And then on Saturday is a kids and adults, a kids and parents um, playground building day. 
So he's going to lead the construction on, you know, using natural materials, the things that you can find from the forest to build a playground for kids that help them develop, you know, their five senses. And then on Sunday is the Kids Day, where it's a program just for kids. Um, so yeah, I'm, I'm looking forward to this. And I think um, what we're doing, when, we, when you really think about what we're doing and what you are doing, Joy, and what we're doing, it's really about the next generation, right? You know, what you're, what you're doing is kind of trying to preserve all these, all these or, or put the spotlight on all this great stuff happening in Japan which is really for the next generation, right? So this stuff doesn't get lost. And that's what we're doing too, you know, trying to to save this mountain for the next generation. That's awesome. That's so good to hear because quite often when we're planning, uh, officially planning development, it seems to leave the kids out of it. You know, it doesn't doesn't reflect what they want and what their voice is. I love this mm. new development we just had in the city right opposite the Peace Park. And they mm. included a skate park for, for the teens. And that nice. rarely happens in new developments. So having a voice, having an interest from the kids and things that they sh should and will care about mm. uh, and doing better for our generation, doing less damage, is definitely something we want to do, right? Yeah, yeah. And then uh, end of the month of May, you have your open day again. That's awesome. Yeah, May 28th. Yeah. Yep. And anything else coming up that we haven't talked about yet? Um, one, yeah, one thing we haven't talked about is June 1st through the 6th, we're hosting a natural plastering with earth and lime workshop. Um, this is one of our probably, yeah, that's it. That's it there. I think the, the dates are different. That's from 2019, but it's June 1st through the 6th. And you'll probably find a link in uh, maybe some show notes or on, on YouTube for that, but um, it's one of our most popular workshops. We do the Japanese bamboo lattice, the base coat plaster, the, the, the middle coat, the brown coat plaster, and then different types of finishes as well. Um, this year we'll also be doing a cow manure earth finish on the exterior of a building. In my experience, adding cow manure to the earth plaster really helps improve its water resistance. And we also do kind of all the traditional Japanese finishes, like the shikui lime plastered finish. So, yeah, it's a, it's always a, a a good educational workshop. And for people who are interested in, you know, using these skills and renovating their house, um, it's also a good opportunity. Yeah, that's great. Um, one other thing that you often do, and you can see it here, is all the natural earth colors. So you're choosing different color dirt. Uh, which changes the color of the plaster? Is that right? Exactly. Exactly. Yeah. Um, the the second the second floor of the main house at Permaculture Center Kamimomi is a, a variety of different clays from around Japan, um, around our area, from different areas of Japan, and even from different countries. One of the participants brought some red clay from Mexico that we used in one of the finishes. I wonder what that conversation was, bringing it in through customs. I'm bringing dirt, th my I friend. I'm pretty sure she <laughs> snuck it in. <laughs> and it really wasn't that much, dessert? right? It yeah, was, yeah. It was Just probably a little like, bit uh, to give color. Yeah. Yep. Uh, do you use any other like natural dyes to change the straw color before you put it in? For example, I know a lot of um, people using natural dyes. They use persimmon, for example. Or, or different kinds of natural dyes to change the color a little bit? Yeah, in our, in our textiles workshop, um, we have done things like kakishibu, right? The persimmon, the fermented persimmons. Um, also um, chestnut, um, chestnut hulls. Um, other, you know, whole, there's, there's almost no end to natural dyes, right? The world of natural dyes is, yeah. yeah. I'd but love in to terms, get Aizome house, yeah, all Aizome. blue. And we, we also grow Aizome as well. In fact, in fact, this, yeah, this t-shirt is our Aizome. That's beautiful blue color. Yeah. Amazing. Yeah. Um, and uh, also naturally fermented. So yeah, we've been, we've been successful in growing and fermenting I. That's great. Too. But in, for, for plastering, generally you don't use uh, veg, vegetable dyes in plasters, generally like mineral. Mineral dyes are used for coloring plasters. That's really interesting. 
Any like stones that you would crush and use in the plastering? I haven't, but I, I have heard of people doing that for, for pigments, like finding colored stones and crushing the colored stones to create a pigment. Yeah, I've heard of that. And uh, like our area, we have a lot of oysters in Hiroshima. Mm -hmm. I've heard of someone crushing the oyster shells and using it in walls. I don't know if yeah. If that's um, one of one of the traditional ingredients in shikui, the Japanese lime plaster, that is, it's made most commonly from um, limestone. Limestone is burnt, burnt to create the the lime plaster. But you can also burn um, shells uh, to create the the lime plaster. How interesting! Yeah, Kyle, your your training, your passion has always been. Uh, plastering is it is it still or as you're doing more like organic farming is it kind of changing are you developing more skills now i'm um well yeah I'm, you're always learning stuff on this mountain too um but probably if i think about it i'm i'm happiest when i'm plastering i think yeah how would you suggest someone get started if they're interested in in plastering um well, if, if you're interested in, in just plastering for yourself, I think one of our workshops is a great way to, to learn more about it. Um, we're hosting the, the Natural Plastering Workshop in the beginning of June, and we have the Earthen Storehouse restoration. There'll be a lot of plastering then, too, the beginning of May. So if you're interested in, in for plastering for yourself, that's a great way to get involved. Um, if you're looking to do it as a profession, um, you'll want to find somebody that you can train under. Uh, there are a number of um, trade schools in Japan that teach plastering, like the one in Hyogo Prefecture. There's um, a very good trade school in Kyoto. Um, that's the school that I went to. Um, and I've also heard that there's a trade school in Toyama or Ishikawa Prefecture. Um, but in any case, you'll want to find a mentor who can, who can teach you, kind of put you under their wing and um, show you the ropes. Yeah, that's awesome. And do you do anything online for people who aren't in Japan? Um, I have never done anything online. Yeah, yeah, it's a bit hard. You need to see and touch the materials to be able to train, right? Yeah, yeah. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Norie about, uh, did you realize your dream of having a composting toilet? I believe you did, right? Yeah, all of our toilets are composting toilets. Um, at this point, we just use a, a very simple 20-liter um, bucket sawdust composting toilet. You have a, you know, the five-gallon bucket, the 20-liter bucket um, under a wooden die, a wooden platform, and uh, like with a wooden toilet seat. Um, and you would use it just like you would a regular toilet, but instead of flushing it with water, you put in sawdust over the top of it. And then when the bucket's full, that gets emptied into the composting station, washed, and then put back. It's uh, it's a super, it's a very simple system. It doesn't need any water, well, just for washing. It doesn't use any electricity. Um, it doesn't break, it doesn't get clogged. Um, and all of the nutrients can return to the soil. You were talking about keeping that, uh, the sewage for five years or for a year, like before you use it in, yeah. the, in the fields? Yeah, yeah, we, I, I generally like to let the, the compost um, ferment for two years before we use it. And at this time, we just use it around fruit trees. But yeah, yeah it's, it's, it's nice to know that all those nutrients are going back to the earth and not going into a river or into the ocean, or they're not a burden on some kind of water treatment system. Yeah, I remember talking to Asby Brown uh, from his book, uh, What What is Enough, right? Talking about the Edo Jidai. That's an uh, awesome just, book. Just Enough, right? That's so, an awesome and they book. talk about the night soil and how night soil was always reused uh, in the Edo era. So this this has links to Japanese history as well, right? Yeah, as, as I understand it, the Seibusen in Tokyo that runs from Tokyo to Saitama was actually first built to carry human manure from Tokyo to Saitama to use to grow crops and then to carry those those crops that produce from Saitama to Tokyo. 
Wow. I think it's just, it's like a mental hurdle that a lot of us have, right? Um, yeah. But they have like a compost toilets that, that use solar um, to keep like an air vent going through. So it's mm -hmm. even in modern cafes. I've seen in the rural area, it makes a lot of sense. You don't have to create a whole septic system, mm -hmm. right? Mm -hmm. Mm -hmm. Just to have their compost toilet. So I think we're going to see more of it uh, in the next five years, definitely. Yeah, on on the, the topic of composting toilets, we have plans to build a two-story composting toilet where the, the compost chamber is directly under the toilet, so there's no need to carry it or move it. Um, and we have we have uh, plans, I think, good plans to to make sure that it's it's well vented, so you don't have to worry about you know any kind of uncomfortable smell. Yeah. Well, even if you visit uh, national parks in America now, most of the national parks have a composting toilet as the main public toilet area. Um, mm -hmm. So you know, a lot of even big organizations or companies are seeing the benefits of it, right? Nice. Yeah. Um, so. We have 10 more minutes, Kyle. Uh, what do you imagine? What is the future of Kamimomi Permaculture Center? How do you see it growing and developing over the next few years? Yeah, our, our limiting factor right now is housing for people. Um, we get lots of inquiries from people who want to work with us, who people who want to live nearby and kind of collaborate. But there's a, a limited of housing. So what we're trying to do is just, you know, make make more connections with local people, get more um, empty houses, renovate them and get people living here. Cause that's, I think what the land needs is people to, to make use of these resources right now. Right now, the majority of the Japanese population lives in Tokyo and they get their, they get their energy from abroad. Um, they get their food from abroad. Uh, the building materials come from abroad. So really, I think making use of the Japanese um, Satoyama requires people and getting people back on the land and when you think about it we've got soil fields gardens orchards plantation forest mixed deciduous forest um kind of like mature climax ecosystems we've got water we've got bamboo straw stone everything we need is right here so yeah we need people to make use of it That's so awesome. so finding you know, creating more places for people to live here. And then also, I think when you look at rural Japan, um, where populations are growing and thriving, a common denominator is alternative education. So um, there's no immediate plan to start a school, but I think, I think that's, um, it's in the future. It's, I think it'll happen at some point where there'll be a, even a greater concentration on, um, um, young young children that makes so much sense and yeah. uh, like we have peace education in the school system we have kids growing some vegetables in the elementary school but why not have more fundamental sustainably led education that's really going to prepare them for the kind of future education that they need right yeah i think that's actually one of the first things that led me to permaculture when i was 18 years old i was um, in conventional education for 12 years in, in the United States. And um, I kind of like looked back and thought about my education the, the, last, the last 12 years when I was 18. And um, I had learned nothing um, to provide for my fundamental needs of food, shelter, energy, clothing. It was almost like I got this abstract education to to stand at the top of an economic pyramid. Like I was, I was educated to become a like in, to work in finance, right? Like you in the in the American education system, you don't learn any con, concrete skills, at least in the 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 schooling that I had. Um, and that was when I was eighteen. I was like, man, you know, that's. It, that was what what led me to think about what kind of life do I want to live? What do I want to learn? What kind of skills do I need to to live on the earth? Yeah, yeah. I I know having kids in Japan and raising them here. Uh, one of the things we're thinking as parents is how can we prepare them for the future? So you sign them up for karate lessons so they know self defense and how to meditate. Uh, you sign them up for swim class so they know how to swim. But man, wouldn't it be great to sign them up for organic farming lessons, uh, build your own structures, you know, like these 
these are life skills that I think our, our kids are going to need in the oh, future. Yeah. And or they would love it. Understand, right? The kids would love it. Yeah. Um, I remember so when I was, uh, um, I think it was about 2015, I was in the United States. Um, I made a connection with a local middle school and I was helping them plaster um, a really beautiful uh, greenhouse and multi-purpose space. And I remember the, the teachers commenting that the students that were most engaged in plastering were the kids that um, were, the, were the biggest problem in the classroom. And, you know, doesn't it make sense? They don't want to be in a classroom, right? They want to be using their, their full body to do something. Um, it's yeah, like so Scandinavia has the they've got the concept, right? They get the kids outside, uh, go through the forest as part of your education almost every day, you know. I mean, play yes. and exploring in mm -hmm. nature is so important part of education. Another yeah. thing you said about the self-sustainability of, of permaculture center that you're creating, that is the city, that is the community of the future, if you ask me, mm -hmm. right. Now, yeah. We have smart cities being developed around Japan and around the world. The whole focus is on technology and robots doing everything, but they're not growing food. They're not capturing their water. Mm -hmm. You know, mm -hmm. how are they really going to survive in those kind of smart cities? That doesn't sound sustainable to me. You know? <laughs> yeah, I don't think it sounds very smart. <laughs> <Yeah>. <laughs> Unless you get the robots to grow your food, right? Yeah. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kyle, for joining. Uh, is, yeah, really nice talking all to you. of your exciting upcoming events. And I really appreciate everything that you're doing, all this uh, building a better, more sustainable future generation, but also for people right now who are just desperate to learn alternatives, which makes sense. I think we're stuck in this loop where so much of what is normal doesn't really make sense for us anymore, right? Yeah, yeah. And um, I don't know if you watch the news at all, but like the 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 escalation of the war in Ukraine and the financial crisis in the United States and things don't look good. Yeah. yeah. Especially with uh, post-COVID reality, right? Uh, we want to go back to normal, but we don't want to go back to the same normal. We want a new, more healthy, uh, outside, uh, more meaningful normal. Uh, I think that's what everyone's seeking. That's awesome. Yeah. yeah. Well, thank you so much, Kyle. That was great conversation. I enjoyed it so much. Oh, yeah. Yeah, I really enjoyed talking to you. Thank you. I hope I can come out and see it for myself soon. I, it's on my list. I'm on my way. <laughs> okay, we're waiting for you. Yay. I can't wait. Nice. All right. Thanks, everyone, for joining. Hopefully, see you again next time. Thank you so much, Kyle, for sharing all your insights and wonderful upcoming events. I will put all the necessary links below. Definitely sign up and get over there if you can. Thanks a awesome. lot, everyone. Awesome. Have a great thank day. You. Thanks, Kyle. Yeah, thank you.